hormesis has got a lot of attention the last few years, but it's actually an old concept. Mithridates was a king in ancient times who exposed himself continuously with small amounts of poison so that he can avoid dying in an attempt of getting poisoned. And according to the myth, he managed to escape death when someone attempted to do so. This is basically the concept of hormesis. We expose ourselves gradually to small amounts of stress so we can deal with higher levels of stress when that comes. However, in order for this to really happen, the stimuli and the final stressor have to be linked. So if, for example, I'm going to be taking on an ongoing basis uh, some punches, I would potentially be able to tolerate a much stronger punch. Or if I'm to be exposing myself to cold uh, water, I would probably be able to tolerate uh, much colder temperatures at some point in the future. But uh, if uh, the stimuli and the final stressor are not linked, chances are that uh, I will not be generating any hormesis. An example would be from uh, the army. So. When I was uh, servicing the army, we were undergoing a lot of uh, psychological stress. And the concept behind that was by enduring the stress under these situations, which were controlled, my country was at peace at the time, we would be able to tolerate a more stressful situation, which would be uncontrolled in the case of a war. Although the final situation might be slightly different from the simulations that uh, we were having, there would still be higher purpose that would serve in both situations. So this is another way where we can link the stimuli and the, the final stressor. Can hormesis be achieved through breathing? I'm going to say that potentially yes, provided we want to become more tolerable to a stressor that is breathing related. So if we want to train ourselves to become very good at diving by training hypoxias in dry land, we will potentially accustomize our physiology into the hypoxic state. Another situation where breath work can help us become more tolerant to big stressors is in cases of asthma or panic attacks, which are known to be accompanied by hyperventilation and uh, erratic breathing. Having said that, uh, I think that breath uh, in the process of hormesis is best to be used not as a stressor but as a coping mechanism. So exposing ourselves uh, to something stressful such as public speaking and ice bath, we can use uh, breath work uh, to help us deal with it more efficiently. If you decide to use breathing for hormesis, uh, the best uh, option is to perform breath holds at the end of the exhalation. As uh, you can see in the graph, uh, breath holds at the end of the exhalations uh, have been shown to create the highest uh, stimuli in our sympathetic nervous system. What seems to create the least stimuli in the sympathetic nervous system is hyperventilation. Which brings us uh, to the last point of this video on uh, whether hyperventilation can serve as hormesis. And in my opinion, there is zero validity in that approach. Number one, when we are hyperventilating, we're not conscious of what goes on. Because of the Bohr effect, our sensors, including our brain, will have limited supply of oxygen. Without being aware of our environment, how can we adapt into any stressor whatsoever? Number two, the stressor itself is not particularly big. It is not hard at all to breathe heavily. You can breathe heavily for one hour. Try to do back-to-back -back breath holds for one hour. It will be a lot harder. And finally, there is no specificity. So even if you argue that uh, it is hard for you to breathe uh, like you're having an orgasm, how will that make you more resilient uh, to a stress that you will find at work uh, or in your personal life? For these reasons, I think that uh, hyperventilating should not uh, be considered a hormetic uh, approach. And if someone wants to go down the path and use breath work for that purpose, his best of uh, practicing breath holds at the end of the exhalation.